This video looks at a method to determine the thickness of a flexible pavement for an urban road. This is a simple design process but gives you an idea of what road design involves. The design is based on the table shown here. It was taken from the Auckland Transport Code of Practice, but there is a similar table in Austroad's Pavement Structural Design Code, which is used by NZTA. There are other more sophisticated methods of designing a pavement, which are used for busier roads such as state highways, but are not covered by this course. The x-axis is the equivalent standard axle, or ESA and it is a measure of the volume and type of traffic using the road. A road with more vehicles is going to have a higher ESA than one with fewer vehicles. A road with a higher proportion of heavy vehicles is going to have a higher ESA than a road with few heavy vehicles. Note this is plotted on a log scale, like the grading curve we looked at for uh, base course aggregates. Once again, this is done because we need to consider a wide range of values. The traffic flows, and hence the ESA, of a residential street is 10 times smaller than that of a collector road, so the log scale helps us to see the whole range of ESA values. The calculation of ESA is beyond the scope of this course, but this chart does not need you to do this calculation as it provides typical ESAs for different roads, and these are shown as vertical dashed lines on the chart. Local residential roads, such as those used to access properties in a residential area, have the lowest ESA, as you would expect, as they have a low number of vehicle movements and hardly any trucks using them. This compares to a business area collector, which would provide access to business areas as well as through traffic to other areas. This would have a high number of vehicles using the road and there would be more heavy vehicles, such as trucks, delivering materials to the businesses. Therefore, it has a higher ESA equivalent standard axle. Uh, in between these two scenarios are roads used for local business access and collector roads for residential areas. The CBR stands for California Bearing Ratio, which is the measure of the strength of the subgrade and correlates to the bearing capacity of the subgrade soil. Note that we looked at CBR for a base course aggregate uh, as part of TNZM5. In this case, we're talking about the CBR of the subgrade, a totally different material, but we use the same test. It is, the CBR is measured by the force required to drive a standard plunger into a subgrade at a set rate. A soft clay would have a CBR of around 5. Moist sand has a CBR of around 10, while lime stabilised soil would have a CBR around 30 or 40. Uh, the CBR of a base course aggregate is 80 and above. This is what is required by uh, TNZ M4, which we looked at in a previous video. The strength of the subgrade determines the depth of the pavement required. A weak subgrade requires a thicker pavement to distribute the traffic loads to a level that can be borne by the subgrade. A stronger subgrade would not need as thick a pavement as, there has, as it has a higher bearing capacity and can withstand higher loadings without deforming or slipping. Therefore, the pavement does not need to distribute the traffic loads as much, and so the pavement can be thinner. The total thickness of granular layers is on the y-axis and tells you how thick the pavement needs to be to distribute the traffic loads to a suitable pressure at the subgrade. The chart also shows how the pavement is split between sub-base and base course. The base, the base course material costs more, so you want to minimise the thickness of the base course layer. The minimum base course layer thickness is shown as the speckled area at the top of the chart. The minimum thickness for a base course is 100 millimetres, which is 2.5 times the diameter of the largest aggregate particles, which is about 40 millimetres for a gap 40. Layers thinner than 100 millimetres would not compact properly. The minimum base course layer thickness increases as the traffic loadings, shown as the ESA, get higher. Higher traffic loadings mean higher loads on the base course and so it needs to be thicker. In particular, higher traffic loadings mean more horizontal forces, which the base course needs to resist. 
The striped area below the base course shows the minimum thickness for the subbase. You will recall that the subbase material is normally gap 65, which means the dimension of the largest aggregate particle is 65 millimeters. You cannot make the subbase any thinner than the hatched area, which is 65 millimeters deep. If you find that your pavement depth is going into the striped area, then you need to make the base course layer thicker and not have a subbase, or make the subbase and hence the whole pavement thicker than it needs to be. To design the pavement, you just need to know what the CBR is and what the type of road you're building. Uh, this design is best shown with an example. Let's say we're designing a road for access to houses in a subdivision on a silt soil with a CBR of 7. Houses in the subdivision would make it a local residential road with an equivalent standard axle of 4 times 10 to the 5. How that is calculated is beyond the scope of this course. We are given that value in the chart, so we don't need to calculate it in this case. Our GTEC investigation has shown that the in situ soil has a CBR of 7. So we start at the CBR equals 7 curve at the right and follow it up to the vertical line for the local residential road as shown by the green dotted line. We track across from the intersection of the curve and the vertical line to the y-axis as shown by the blue line. I estimate the value on the y-axis is about 325 to 330 millimetres. You could say it is 325, but that is better to round up to make sure the layer is thick enough. So let's say it's 330 millimetres thick. Remember that someone has to lay the road and they will not be millimeter accurate, so it's better to be slightly high than slightly low. Note that we now have the thickness of our base course, which is 330 millimeters. We now need to figure out how much of how thick is the base course and how thick is the subbase. So we track up from the intersection to the underside of the speckled base course area, as shown by the red dotted line. We then track across to the y-axis, as shown by the orange line. I estimate the value of the y-axis, where the orange dotted line hits it, to be about 140 millimetres. That is the minimum thickness of the base course for this pavement is 140 millimetres. I could make it thicker, but that would cost more. So now we have the base course thickness, is 140 millimeters. Lastly, we calculate the subbase thickness, that is the total pavement thickness, which is 330 millimeters, minus the base course thickness, which is 140 millimeters. Therefore, the subbase is 190 millimeters thick. Put another way, the pavement is composed of 190 millimeter thick subbase with 140 millimeter thick base course on top giving a total pavement thickness of 330 millimetres. So that's designing the pavement, design the road itself. Now we need to know how wide the road is. We use the council code of practice for that as well. In this case, the council is represented by Auckland Transport, so we use their code of practice. This drawing is a standard detail from Auckland Transport's code of practice. You will find a link to the Auckland Transport Code of Practice in the Resources section. The link takes you to the Code of Practice contents. Looking down the contents, we see that Chapter 7 is Road Layout and Geometric Design, which sounds like it may have some details on how our road needs to be laid out. Clicking on that takes us to the section, and down the bottom is the download for the drawings. Going through the drawings, I find the one pictured here, which is titled Local Road Cross Section, which is what I'm looking for and that that drawing is shown here. It does take you a bit of time to find your way around these codes of practice as they have to contain a lot of information. Finding the right guidance is one of those skills you need to develop to be a road designer. Using tables of content is one way of doing this as the people that produce these codes use headings and tail to titles to make it easier for users to find what they want. So let's zoom in on the drawing. We can see that the carriageway consists of two lanes, 
each with a three meter wide traffic lane and 2.2 meter parking lanes, giving a total lane width of 5.2 meters. The grass berm is 1.3 meters and the footpath 2.0 meters. I should emphasize that these are guidelines and the designer has the option of varying the design as they see fit, but they do need to sell the new design to the council who have the final say on what is accepted. So let's just go with the design suggested in the code for this particular road. So this is what our road's gonna look like with the design we have done so far. You can see how the design work we did has been set out in a cross-section drawing that, has, that the constructors can use to build the road. The thickness of the pavement layers and the widths of the road are shown. I've also added the assumption that the subgrade has a CBR of 7. The design only works if the subgrade is actually that strength or stronger, so we need to specify it on the drawing. If we find that it is less when we test it during construction, then we need to either increase the CBR with compaction or stabilisation, or we need to change the design. I've also added a notation specifying the curb and channel to be used. You will find this profile on drawing GD009 of the Auckland Transport Code standard drawings. You will find this set on Moodle, or you can access the Auckland Transport Code of Practice directly by Googling Auckland Transport COP. The link to the code should be near the top. Go to the site, then select Chapter 7. The drawing download is at the bottom of Chapter 7 list of contents. If you look at the Auckland Transport code drawings, then you will find details for other types of curb and channel and the footpath that you need to complete the cross section. You will also find other details such as the plan layout for driveways, vehicle crossings, roundabouts, traffic islands and cul-de-sacs. All of these details can be cut and pasted into the drawing set for your road. We still have the drainage and the vertical and horizontal alignments to design and the road cross section would vary as we saw on the drawing set we looked at in the road design pro topic. But hopefully you get an idea of how the pavement and some of the road design proceeds for this simple road and how the design is presented in a drawing for the construction team. We have also have to provide information about the materials and standards of workmanship required to build the road. These details were provided in the specifications that we looked at in the previous topic. Between them, the specifications and the drawings provide much of the detail the constructors need to build the road. 